Was the B-47 a marvel of the jet age and a forefather of most modern jet aircraft? After all, most modern commercial jets can trace their design routes directly to the B-47 with a sleek body, a swept back wings, and engines mounted under the wings and pods. Or was it a failed airframe that was pressed into service too quickly under a rushed attempt to stay ahead of the Soviets in the beginning of the Cold War, which ultimately turned out to be a death trap for its crews? Let's look into it. The origin of the B-47 can be traced back to June of 1943. An informal USAAF request led to several aircraft manufacturers to begin studies on multi-engine jet aircraft for fast photo recon or medium bomber activities with a range of 3,500 miles, a service ceiling of 45,000 feet, and a max speed of 550 miles per hour. Even before the USAAF began its proposals, Boeing had been working on the adaptation to, of large aircraft to jet propulsion. The initial study was known by the company as Model 424, which was basically a scaled-down B-29 with four engines that were paired in two pods mounted under each wing. However, wind tunnel tests proved that this design was unsatisfactory. In December of 1944, engineers went back to the drawing board and came up with Model 432, in which all four engines were moved inside the main fuel silage in order to improve the efficiency of the wing. The engines were located right over the main fuel tank area of the fuel silage and were fed by bulbous air intakes located beside the cockpit section. The engines exhausted via tailpipes located on top of the rear fuel silage. The aircraft still resembled the old B-29, but with much thinner wings. The US AAF was sufficiently impressed with this design and awarded Boeing with a Phase 1 study contract for the Model 432. The project was designated the XB-47, and at the time, contracts were awarded to North American for the XB-45, Corvair for the XB-46, and Martin for the XB-48. The configuration of the XB-47 was about to undergo a drastic change just after VE Day in, in May of 1945. The U.S. Army Scientific Advisory Group, headed by the famed aerodynamicist Theodore von Karman, was allowed to visit German aircraft factories and aeronautical research facilities to see if any of the innovations developed there could be incorporated into American designs. Boeing's chief aerodynamicist, George Shearer, accompanied the group on the trip. One of the items that was discovered was the results of some of the German research dating back to the mid-1930s on the use of swept-back wings to improve the performance of high-speed jet aircraft. These studies were similar to research that was carried out by NACA in the United States, confirming the results of those studies. The use of sweep angles as high as 45 degrees enhanced the high-speed performance by delaying the formations of shock waves as the aircraft approached the speed of sound. As soon as the data about German wing design reached Boeing headquarters in Seattle, engineers immediately stopped working on the straight wing XB-47. More wind tunnel tests were done to verify data, which it did, and Boeing began working on a swept wing design of the XB-47. In September of 1945, Boeing was ready with the first swept wing design for the XB-47. It was called the Model 448 inside the company. It retained the fuel silage of the Model 432, but featured a thin wing swept back at an angle of 35 degrees and incorporated two more engines added in the extreme tail for a total of six total engines. The other four engines were still mounted inside of the main fuel silage, but were now fed by intakes at the very tip of the nose and exhausted over the top of the wing. When the US AAF reviewed the design, the positions of the engines caused them a lot of concern. The threat of fire inside of the fuel silage greatly concerned them. Adding to this concern, was the fact that the wings of the design had been made so thin that the entire fuel capacity of the aircraft had to be stored inside of tanks in the main fuel silage. Boeing went back to the drawing board again and came up with the design model 451-1, which carried six engines mounted in pods on the wings. The USAAF liked the change and approved the new design. In late 1945, more changes were made to the design by moving the engines in closer to the fuel silage and the wingspan was increased to 116 total feet. In December of 1945, the US AAF endorsed Boeing's plan to build two prototype XB-47s for testing. In April of 1946, the two XB-47 prototypes were ordered. 
Finally, after various stages of assembly and inspection by the U.S. AAF, work on the final assembly of the XB-47s began in June of 1946. Progress was slow. Many hang-ups with various pieces of the aircraft's equipment presented Boeing with small hurdles to overcome. The landing gear was most notable of these issues. One of the main concerns about the aircraft were the engines. The early turbojet engines had very poor acceleration compared to the piston-driven planes of the past. It was felt that additional thrust was needed for takeoff. This was solved by building in provisions for 18 solid rockets inside the fuel slides just behind the wing. Each small rocket engine had 1,000 pounds of thrust. The crew of the plane consisted of three. A pilot, a co-pilot, a bombardier, and a na or a navigator it was a combined role. The pilot and co-pilot sat in separate tandem seats under a bubble-style cockpit. The navigator sat inside the nose of the plane below the pilots. The navigator had a radar bombing system inside of the bulge that poked out below the nose and was covered up by a plastic bubble flare. Since the fuel was stored inside the fuel slides of the plane, the, plane, the pilot had to be extremely aware of fuel consumption because if fuel tank levels became too uneven during flight, the weight distribution of the aircraft could shift dramatically, causing serious issues with handling. In the original designs, a tail gunner was planned for on the plane, but later it proved to be too difficult to build a pressurized cabin in the rear of the plane for a gunner to be located there. A remote-controlled turret was later incorporated into the design that the co-pilot could operate by swiveling his chair around to face the rear of the aircraft and using a viewfinder with a joystick to operate. But this was finally replaced by radar-guided guns, which consisted of 250 caliber Brownings. The first XB-47 rolled out of the factory in Seattle on September 12, 1947. It was powered by six GE J-35 turbojet engines. It was the first large American plane to feature a swept-wing design. The XB-47 first flew on December 17, 1947. The flight was from Seattle to nearby Moses Air Force Base, and Bob Bobbins and Scott Osler were the, at the controls. The plane was to be put through extensive test flights. The U.S. Air Force tested the first prototypes for about 80, 83 hours. Later testing at Merrick Air Force Base in California revealed that the XB-47 did not meet the specs that Boeing had originally promised. Its ceiling was 2,500 feet below requirement, and 7,500 feet below what was agreed upon. The second XB-47 prototype was fitted with larger 5,200-pound thrust GE J-47 engines prior to its test flights. It flew for the first time on July 12, 1948. The J-47 engines pushed the top speed past the 600-mile-per-hour level. The Air Force eventually accepted both planes. On September 3, 1948, the first production order was placed for the B-47. Since Boeing's Seattle facility was already too busy building the KC-97 tanker, the B-50 bomber, as well as converting the now obsolete B-29s into tanker aircraft, it was decided that the B-47 will be built in Boeing's Wichita, Kansas plant. Ten B-47As were ordered on October 28, 1948, and by February 28, 1949, 65 B-47As had been ordered. In 1954, after having its wings taken off by engine and engines recycled, the first XB-47 prototype Boeing built was cut into two pieces and put on display at Palm Beach Air Force Base in Florida. Even though the B-47 was the perfect weapon for its role, and the Soviets were terrified of it, the airframe itself had some serious issues. In fact, it suffered many losses that today it would be absolutely unthinkable to keep it in service. Over its lifetime, 203 aircraft were lost in crashes. That's over 10% of its complete production. 464 crew members were killed in those crashes. In 1957 and 58 alone, there were 49 crashes that killed 122 men. Absolutely insane numbers. One of the issues that affected the B-47 was from the get-go. The plane was designed during the later stages of World War II, before the jet age had really taken off. The metallurgy and design of aircraft, including the B-47, was mostly based on propeller-driven aircraft principles. Another issue that the B-47 had was during the time of its final design and first production, the Supreme Air Command of the United States was expanding at an absolute insane rate. 
It was the early days of the Cold War, and the importance of having air dominance was never as important as it was now. Many, many projects were rushed, a lot of corners were cut uh, to stay ahead of the Soviets, and pilot training was often lackluster. Many pilots also failed to adapt very well from piston-driven aircraft to the speed and maneuverability of new jet aircraft coming online. From 1951, the year the B-47 officially entered service, to 1957, SAC expanded from 144,525 personnel to over 224,000 personnel. The B-47 fleet went from just 12 to 1,285. In 1951, the B-47 had one medium bomb wing. By 1957, there were 28 bomb wings, each with 45 aircraft each. And in that same time period, the total number of aircraft in SAC went from 1,186 to 2,711. Obviously, all of these aircraft needed flight crews and an absolutely mind-boggling amount of logistics to support them. SAC quickly built a large infrastructure of new air bases new schools for training ground crews, and enormous depots for maintaining and repairing all the aircraft. On top of the ever-changing ever global tensions, the evolution of jet technology changing year to year, and the logistics issues facing the B-47, there was also the simple fact that the B-47 was not a Cadillac you could just lay back in and relax as a pilot. It required your absolute attention. It was a vastly more complex airplane than the B-17 or B-29s of 10 years prior. If the pilot of the B-47 was distracted or took his eyes off the instruments for just a moment, he could very well suddenly find his plane banking into a dive that pushed his speed to a point that the plane was no longer recoverable. Add to that an exhausted crew after 20 hours of flying and you get lots of crashed planes and lots of dead crew members. Many of the accidents happened on takeoff, all with a similar pattern. The high gross weight takeoffs appeared normal until a few seconds after the liftoff then a wing dipped, struck the runway, and the aircraft crashed and burned. Analysis revealed a, power, a loss of power, such as an engine failure or a water injection failure, that would induce yaw. When this happened, the B-47 entered a stall, and the crash was unavoidable at that point. In one low-altitude bombing disaster, the airplane was flown by a crew that on paper was absolutely up to par and should have no issues completing the basic training mission. While going on to perform an Immelman, the aircraft disintegrated immediately, the left wing ripping loose first. The accident report states that the aircraft had performed 508 Immelmans in 253 rolls. The plane was most likely simply worn out. In 1957, a crash killed the crew of a B-47 outside of Orlando, Florida. The crew flying that day was arguably the most experienced B-47 crew in the entire U.S. Air Force. Carrying a British observer on board for a demonstration flight, the plane was making a high-speed turn at an altitude of approximately 2,000 feet when the plane mysteriously disintegrated. In 1958, the B-47's dismal record continued to pile up a body count, peaking in March and April when six B-47s broke apart while flying low-altitude missions. Two of the aircraft were very low-hour planes. One of them had only 1,264 flight hours on it. Of the six crashes, four of them were attributed to st structural fatigue. The B-47 was intended to be SAC's primary bomber until 1965, but by 1958, there was already discussion that it might have, have to be phased out completely. SAC reacted in April by limiting the B-47 to one, only one, 357 miles per hour and 1.5 G max maneuvers. Low-level flying was banned, gross weight could not exceed 185,000 pounds with external tanks, and banking was limited to only 30 degrees. Restrictions were put in place on flights through turbulent air, stalls, and touch-and-go landings. Aircraft also began to be carefully inspected for cracks and the airframe indicated, indicating metal fatigue. In May of 1958, what was to be prim a primary fix arrived via kits that were supposed to be installed in the aircraft and reinforced the, w the wing route at the fuselage of the aircraft. These kits were to be installed on the entire fleet of B-47s. Large pins, nicknamed milk bottles, were used to fuse the wings to the fuselage. In January of 1959, 1,622 B-47s had been upgraded using these kits. 
Results were not immediate. Despite redu reduced hours, 22 more B-47s were lost in crashes. It wasn't until 1960 did the corrective efforts take full effect, and as the B-52 fleet grew, simple economics dictated that the B-47's phase-out would follow. The Air Force learned from the B-47 it was vastly improved training and flying safety procedures, and the B-52 ended up becoming the unquestioned nuclear strike bomber. In the mid-1960s, B-47s began arriving at davis monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona for storage until they were scrapped. The final phase-out of the B-47 bomber wings began in 1963. In, in October of 1965, the Air Force initiated Project Fast Fly to coordinate inactivation of the last five B-47 wings and supporting tanker squadrons. The last B-47 variants were removed from service by 1966. The last flight of a B-47 happened in June of 1986 when a B-47E was flown from the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake to the Castle Air Museum in Atwater, California. Of the more than 2,000 B-47s built, only 21 remain. So was the B-47 a plane that signified a turning point in um, jet design? Or was it a flawed aircraft that was pressed into service too quickly? Let me know in the comments.